So my name is Ben Gramica. I am from InterNACHI. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors. And this is a free live home inspection training class. And we do this about once a month or so. Um, if you needed to contact me or anybody on staff, there is our contact page, natchi.org forward slash contact. If you wanted to check out our next upcoming live class, you go to that next URL. It's natchi.org forward slash webinar. Or um, if you wanted to uh, check out a, a class that has um, passed and you missed it, all of our recordings are there as well. And just a few things, if you're just joining us, you should be able to hear me, I can't hear you. You should be able to see me, and I can't see you. If you want to ask questions, please feel free to type in those questions at the bottom right corner area there. You should have a question box. Um, there's also a chat area. You can ask questions at any time during the webinar, after the webinar. I'll try to get to them. And you can also discuss things amongst yourselves as well. And Freddie is mentioning about Louisiana. So we um, also have a, an approval. We're approved in Louisiana as well to help home inspectors become licensed. And today we're going to do a home inspection by reviewing a couple hundred digital images that I took during the inspection. So I performed this inspection a while back in Pennsylvania, so it's a cold climate. But before we do that, um, we have a conference. So today's date is December 15th, 2015. And in 2016, in March, we have a huge conference for home inspectors. It's called Inspection Universe 2016. It's in Orlando, Florida. And if you want to get more details about that, it's really going to be a great uh, event. We were just in Las Vegas for um, another conference. It's called inspectionconference.com. If you go there, you can check out some details about the upcoming event. And we had um, Jimmy Van Zant um, play for us in Vegas in our last event. It was really great. Hope to see you there. Another program, I, I want to tell you about another thing, um, is we have the Home Energy Score. So become a Home Energy Score Assessor. It's free and online. The training is free and online. Uh, it's really cool 3D training. You become an avatar and you move through a 3D house, three-dimensional house. You can take measurements of the insulation. You can check out the windows and the, the heating and cooling system. And a home energy score assessor, once qualified, puts a score on a home. And the score is kind of like a um, miles per gallon rating on a car. It tells you how efficient or how well this home is performing. The energy efficiency. And the score is from 0 to 10. Most homes score like a 6 or 7. But the idea is to add value to your existing home inspection service. You can perform a home energy score, create a score label report in about 15 minutes because you, during a regular typical home inspection, you're already gathering the information that you need to generate a home energy score. So we have software for you. The software is free and online. We have training for you, even if you don't want to do a home energy score. Um, because you're not in the United States. This is for the United States only. Let's say you don't want to be doing home energy scores. The training is excellent. And here's the website. It's natchez.org forward slash home energy score. You go there for more information. Okay. Another program is the Roof Data Technician program. And this is in the United States as well. And if you wanted to perform a, home, um, a roof data uh, inspection, and get involved in this program. Um, it's free and online, and it's at natchi.org forward slash roof. And this kind of fills in the gaps. If you have open spaces in your calendar, you can make some money doing this. Uh, roof data technician inspection, a job is about 30 to 45 minutes. You get paid about 100 to $140 per job. 
So um, it fills in the your open calendar and maybe it allows you to um, hire a new inspector to grow your company and give that new inspector these jobs so that you don't have to do them. You start managing your company. Um, John asks, are the national exams available on InterNACHI for studying for free? Yep, we have a few exams. Um, we have one national exam, and then we have a huge um, preparation exam to prep you for your state exam. If, you, if you're in a state or a province that regulates home inspectors and they require you to take a national exam, we have a free online preparatory uh, preparation examination. Um, and the exam questions, there's thousands of them that you can go through, uh, and it's all free and online. Um, Mr. Martinez asks about this program, um, either the Home Energy, I'm not sure which program, the ROOF or the Home Energy Score program. If you ever have a problem with any program that you enroll into, um, always feel free to contact me. Ben at internachi.org, and that's my email address right there. And I'll forward you, I'll get somebody to help you. Um, some programs, like the roof warranty program, um, uh, you have to wait until a, your neighbor has a roof event. So you can't really create demand for jobs. So we have to, in the roof data technician program, a job comes in when someone experiences a roof event, like a roof leak, or sees something wrong with their roof, and the roof is covered by Owens Corning, and they call Owens Corning to make a warranty claim. We'll find you, closest person to that homeowner, um, and then, yeah, so you can't really create demand. So you may be sitting for a while. That's why it's really just a, a calendar filler. Uh, again, there's a 50% discount for your first year membership to InterNACHI. It's only for students, non-member students, who are taking this live class. I can see the registration list. If you're watching this on YouTube, it does not count. So that's the trick here. You have to be attending the live class. If you have to leave, or if you forget what we're gonna go over, if there's one thing I can leave you with, it's natchi.org forward slash everything. We kind of put everything on this page. Um, and it's really a 15 step checklist for running a successful home inspection business. And the first step is always join InterNACHI because you get to become trained and certified. Um, and um, that training and certification program is all online and free to our members. So you have to join InterNACHI to get access to the training courses and some benefits. And then step two is you become certified. And we have over 30 certifications to choose from. So it's not just becoming a home inspector, but we have many, many different types of home um, certifications available. And they're all online and free. So natchi.org forward slash everything. If there's one thing I could tell you, it's that. Um, I did a presentation in Wisconsin, and I was talking about the importance of being technically good at performing a home inspection and also working on your marketing. So if this is a scale here, a chart, um, the left side, vertical side column is how good you are technically at being a home inspector. And you want to get trained by InterNACHI to become a really good home inspector. So you want to be up there at 100% well-trained technically, but you also want to be trained well in marketing. So let's say the bottom line, the X axis, you want to be 100% well-trained in marketing and business, running a business. Some inspectors are like this. They become a home inspector, they join an organization, they get trained, and they're very good home inspectors, but they're terrible marketers. And that hurts their business because nobody knows who they are, how good they are. Some home inspectors are really good at marketing themselves. They get all the jobs, but they're terrible home inspectors because they didn't take enough training. Where you want to be is top right corner, right? You want to be really good technically 
how do I do in home inspection? You want to be a really good home inspector, but you also want to be good at operating a successful home inspection business. You're actually a, an owner operator of a business and you just happen to do home inspections. You have to think of yourself as a business owner, not a home inspector, a business owner, and you just do home inspections. Or you, maybe you manage home inspectors in your multi-inspector firm, right? So you wanna be at the top right corner. So in every class that InterNACHI provides, online or live classes, we talk, it's impossible to talk about only technical aspects of running a business being a home inspector. You have to talk about both because they're interdependent. So let's do a home inspection. One of the things that I do is I go up on the roof. According to the standards of practice, you are not required to go up on any roof. You're not required to walk on any surface, even if it's flat. Not required to do that. You have to inspect the roof though. So you can inspect the roof from the ground, the eaves, a ladder, using a spectroscope from inspector outlet. Um, some inspectors are having fun with drones. Um, so you have to inspect the roof, but my brand is that I carry big, tall ladders and I get up on the roof. If I can't get up on the roof, I'm gonna get up to the roof edge and touch the roof so I can get to it. And I take these pictures as part of my service and I provide these pictures to my clients and I also make that my brand. So these pictures are in my home inspection report, which is the most important piece of marketing that I could produce. And I produce one or two a day. So I put really good branded pictures of my service in my inspection report so that I communicate clearly to my client. But also my client is going to give copies because I provide multiple copies, give copies to their coworkers or their friends and family. And it, within that home inspection report is really a description. It's a great idea of who I am, what I do and how good I am and why you should hire me. This is one of the reasons why you should hire me. This is one of the reasons that distinguishes me. Why, this is one of the things that distinguishes me from my competition. Let's say all my competition is here and I'm lined up. What distinguishes me from my competition? Take a step forward. Well, I get up on the roof. I go beyond the standards of practice. Remember, standards of practice is a minimum. You have to follow it. And if you exceed it, you should exceed it for every client. So the NACHI.org SOP has the standards of practice, the International Residential Standards of Practice. And that's where you begin. The standards of practice is the foundation upon which to do a great home inspection and write a great home inspection report. The standards of practice is a guide to my inspection procedure. The first section in the standards of practice is roof. And that's the first part of my inspection procedure. And that's the first chapter in my inspection report. So the standards of practice says, inspect the roof. I get there early. I get to the property early and I go up on the roof. And while I'm inspecting the roof, hopefully my client, I get there early, hopefully my client pulls up in the driveway, looks up and sees me and I wave to him or her. And I'm assuming that that client is well pleased to have hired the right inspector, right? I go far above and beyond what my competition does. I have to figure out how I provide a different kind of value that no one else does. And this was one of them. I also did infrared and mold and all that other stuff. But the standards of practice is where I begin and end and how I move through the home and how I write my report. It's a reflection. The standards of practice are reflected into my inspection procedure. Or maybe I should say my inspection procedure reflects the standards of practice. And my inspection images. When I do my, my images, I carry two cameras, one for pictures, one for video, and also my infrared images. I take my pictures in a procedure that reflects the standards of practice. I also take video, too, of all the systems and components that reflect the standards of practice. My inspection report is written according to how I inspected, which is reflected in the standards of practice. The inspection agreement refers to the standards of practice. 
the home maintenance book that I give to my clients. So this is the InterNACHI home maintenance book. Every chapter of the home maintenance book refers to the standards of practice that I follow. It's also for Florida specific, and it's also in Spanish. The homeowner newsletter that I provide to my client reflects the things that I inspected. If I found a hole in the roof, then Shazam, the first issue of the customizable home maintenance newsletter that I send out to all my clients, has something about roof maintenance. Why would I use a homeowner newsletter? To keep in touch with all my clients. I don't just say goodbye after I get paid, I keep in touch with them. And also my inspection business website. So here's my website. I don't do home inspections anymore. I created this in a few hours just to show that a home inspector can create a really good modern website. And um, my website reflects my brand. So one of the things that I like to show is my qualifications. I performed a lot of inspections. I'm certified. And there's my tall ladder, me getting up to the gutter edge and taking a look. Also infrared. And all of these certifications here that are listed are from InterNACHI, free and online. And there are all the logos. So very little text, a lot of images. You get to see who I am pretty well. You get the full, it's congruence. Everything that I do, everything that I provide, everything that I say, everything I write, um, my website, my marketing that was designed by InterNACHI's marketing team, everything is familiar with each other. It's the same message, congruence, nothing different. Somebody landing on my website gets a really great idea, comprehensive, full understanding of who I am, what I do, and why I should be hired. Think of that as part of your business approach. You have to have that type of, that's the marketing aspect, that, that blue dot, right? You want to move that blue dot to the right and up. Okay, let's do a home inspection. So this roof has some shingle tabs. It's a three tab shingle. The tabs have probably um, blown off. It's an older roof. Um, the problem is that now you have um, open water entry points, water intrusion points, which are the roofing nails. And there's a few of them, and someone's been up there. Someone got the old shingle tabs, right, and glued them back on with silicone. So it's kind of ridiculous. Really poor repair. Um, I also take a look at the, all the roof penetrations, so that includes the chimney typically in northern cold climates um, and any flue pipe that comes through the vent pipe and there's um, the flashing around the vent pipe and also the flashing where the roof meets anything else so a wall right and I want to see step flashing and counter flashing or the siding um, being used as counter flashing um, there's a lot of sealant there's a lot of white silicone in this area um, the flashing is installed I can see that the step flashing is installed right there, but they've added white silicone, and this silicone is simply a Band-Aid. Silicone does not last very long, especially on a roof system. So I put that in report as a concern. Monitoring is recommended. But I think the roof is going to be repaired anyways, because we have these cracked shingles. So I'm going to now add this to the contractor who's going to follow my inspection and make repairs. Um, flashing. I'm not too concerned about the, the standing seam uh, rust there, rust surface on that too much. And there's the roof. So when I get up on a roof, um, I, I've been trained to do it. Don't get up on any roof, really. Uh, if you're not trained to do so, you're not required to do so, just don't. Um, I've built homes. I've installed roofs. I use equipment, safety training. I get up on a roof and I take a look at all the planes. So I take a picture of all the planes, take a picture of the ridge, I go around and I take um, video as well. And here we have a chimney stack in the back, another missing shingle on the ridge, another missing shingle. And there's a picture that I like to inst um, put in my report where I'm actually standing on the roof. 
so that my future client who's reading my inspection report knows that, um, well, there's another reason that I should be hired. I get up nice and close to the shingles. That's a really good inspection picture as well. And there's the chimney stack. So I, I, I'm going to assume that this is, um, it looks like a fireplace just because of the shape of the flue and its location in the structure, uh, rear right corner. And the masonry or the stucco exterior is cracked and there's salt deposits, efflorescence on the crack opening. And you could see that this is um, absorbing water, wicking moisture in the opening cracks. There's a crack in salt deposits, efflorescence, cracking. There's a lot of cracking on this chimney stack. The flashing is heavily sealed with white silicone. Um, the flashing is installed well, but um, I'm not sure why it's sealed up so much. Um, really should be the top counter flashing, ideally is grooved into the masonry and then sealed up. It was simply attached. So there's a, a chunk of masonry now being popped off the chimney stack. And we also have efflorescence in the basement. So I want to jump down real quick. And efflorescence and moisture and masonry and cracking and wicking and osmosis are all connected together. This isn't necessarily water um, freezing in the wintertime and bursting open. Um, it could be. But that's efflorescence of a typical CMU uh, concrete masonry unit in the basement. To understand how moisture affects a home, we have a moisture course. Oh, and it's just not available. Let's see. Oh, looks like our, our education page is down for the moment. Well, I'll take a look at that later. We have a moisture course at natchi.org forward slash moisture course. If you go there and you take the course and you're a certified home inspector, you become a, a certified moisture inspector. And the neat thing is that you get to learn how moisture wicks through masonry material. Masonry is porous. And masonry can um, um, wick. There's a wicking. Um, there's physics involved. So moisture wicks through this masonry and it has a theoretical limit of about six miles, theoretically. Think of a tree, a very large tree. That is wicking moisture up into the, the structure of the tree. And that's how you find moisture in a foundation because that foundation, for example, the poured concrete foundation is poured directly on the ground. And that ground, that earth is damp. And so that dry masonry pulls that up. For a foundational unit like that, the white stuff, that's efflorescence. That's salt deposits left behind after the moisture passes through the masonry material and evaporates. Now to get this damage, there's a thing called osmosis. Um, when moisture moves through masonry and salt deposits are left behind because of evaporation, that causes that salt deposit concentration causes an imbalance and nature abhors an imbalance. So what does it need to do? What does it like to do? It brings in more moisture to dissolve or dilute that salt concentration. And when that moisture moves through the concrete masonry, there's um, pressure involved, osmos osmotic pressure, osmotic pressure. And that pressure can damage concrete because that pressure is greater. It's like 3,000 to 5,000 PSI, that osmosis pressure of water pushing through to get to that edge of the masonry. And that's stronger than concrete itself. So when you see masonry blowing out, it could be, yep, the first thing in a cold climate would be, oh, that's, that's ice freezing, expanding, and popping stuff off. Could be, but it could be also the, the um, physics of wicking and osmosis. And we train you on that kind of stuff. And we show you signs of efflorescence and cracking and moisture and wicking in our moisture course. So there's the flu. You don't have to inspect the flu of any chimney stack. 
or flu liner or docked. But I take a picture anyways, because I have it in my camera, and oftentimes I'll see damage on the interior terracotta flu lining material. And if you don't know how to inspect a chimney stack, well, guess what? We have a course for you. It's how to inspect, let's see if it's, there it is, how to inspect fireplaces and chimneys. And you go there and we have a bunch of photographs of flues, different types of flues and clay lining and metal flue lining, cast in place lining, fuel gas terminations, things like that. Oh, uh, let's see if the moisture course is available. I'm not sure why that link, there we are. So here's that, here's a video of wicking. You can see the water just moving on up through the porous material of that stone. So if you're inspecting stone, stucco, eaves, concrete, and wicking has a theoretical limit of about six miles. And so um, we teach you on how to inspect for moisture intrusion. It isn't just for crawl spaces or basements. It could be for a chimney stack as well. And I'm moving my way down to the secondary roof surfaces, and I'm following how water, moisture, rain moves on a structure from the roof, slanted, sloped, caught by the gutters, directed down um, to the ground with downspouts, um, and then hopefully diverted away. This one is not, so there's a missing diverter pipe there. It's just dumping water right next to the foundation. Right there is a great indication, I have to remember this, because I know that a house is a system of interdependent parts. If I see a downspout dumping hundreds of gallons of water at the right next to the foundation, I don't care if it's concrete masonry units or poured concrete, or has some kind of waterproofing system, that is gonna stick in my head. And when I get down into the basement or crawl space, I'm gonna remember that front right corner could have a problem. Um, if you want more technical training on inspecting a roof, we have a mastering roof inspection series. And it is, I don't know if you can see, but I'm gonna scroll slowly, a ton of articles written by Kenton Shepard of InterNACHI. So we call it the Mastering Roof Inspection Series. And it teaches you everything you need about mastering your roof inspection service. So take a look at that. If there's anything you're weak on, like inspecting the exterior, we have multiple courses, free and online to our members, to help you become really good technically in that area. If you're weak on business and marketing, we have a marketing team that can help you with your marketing, make you look professional so that when you hand your business card to a real estate agent who knows everything about good marketing, you look professional. And also we have a business course, a free online business course as well. So let's take a look at the exterior. Um, when I do the exterior, I'm looking for the slope. I'm still thinking about water going away from the, the house. So I, I wrap around. When I get off of the roof, I'm basically done with the roof inspection. I've taken all my pictures, all my video, and I've also, I carry a, a mobile device. So I write my inspection report with my mobile device. And there's software that we provide um, through our vendor partners if you need that mobile software. And um, when I come down from my ladder, I'm done with the roof and I can greet my clients or real estate agent or the homeowner, anyone who's there. And I can take my client around. I invite them to be there with me. I take my client around. I do counterclockwise. Some inspectors go or some inspectors start in the kitchen. It doesn't matter. Um, and I take my client around, show them the major things um, all the way around the exterior. And then I send them in to go look at the interior and have fun. And if I find anything major, I'll come in and get them. And I'll eventually come in in about 15 minutes or so. And then we'll go down to the basement or get to the heating and cooling system or electrical or foundation system. And then I, I send them in and then I go around myself and I really inspect. And I'm also writing my inspection report with my mobile device and taking pictures and photographs. And this is the exterior. So I don't want the siding in contact with the dirt. 
I want clearance. I'm also taking a note on the siding materials and the exposed wood. So there's a lot of wood on this home, wood siding, wood trim. Oh, and there's also other systems on the exterior. And this is the electrical system. This is the meter. And it has settled. There's an underground line and the earth dirt around the house has settled and has literally pulled the main meter box off of the house. And now the electrical system is part of my exterior inspection and it's part of the moisture inspection as well because now moisture can get behind that meter box and it's electrical hazard as well. This should not be loose. Can't believe it's gone that long. Probably since, you know, the very beginning of the home. And there's the main electrical line going to the panel down in the basement. Um, and that has settled. And then over in the corner, I see there's um, a one and a half inch pipe, maybe, maybe two inch diameter pipe going into the downspout pipe. Um, we're not required to inspect anything underground, but I have a sneaky suspicion there's a sump pump and that's a discharge in there. And I bet it's not connected very well because that is at an angle to the vertical pipe. So I bet there's a big hole in there and it's just discharging water underground from that sump pump. So now I probably have a sump pump discharge. I've got downspout, remember, front right corner, dumping a lot of water at the foundation. I have a sump pump discharge problem. So this is turning out to be a kind of a, a fun inspection. Uh, we have electrical training uh, courses and video like crazy. Um, my favorite is with Paul Abernathy. And um, what we did was we built a wall and asked Paul, a wall of um, electrical systems and components and asked Paul to get in there. This is all dead. It's dead wiring, dead, there's no electricity there. So we go right into the panel and take a look. And then we go to a real live house and take a look as well. So we have um, anything you're weak on or anything you need advanced training on, we have that for you. So there's a sump pump, um, exterior components like the water discharge, uh, the spigot, it's frost free. Um, GFCI protection for all exterior receptacles. I like to take a look at the door, any door and window. I take a look, to, I tend to daily take a look at the top right corner, top left corner, bottom right corner, bottom left corner of any door or window or, or through way passage. And I can see that there's some areas of improvement. There's some open spots here and some cracking of the masonry at the tread. The storm door doesn't close. The exterior siding looks pretty good. Um, there's some um, discoloration and some weird stuff going on here. This looks like wood rot. Somebody painted over some wood rot at the window frame itself, the structural component of the window frame itself. So that's a, a problem. And there's the exterior back and the deck posts. There's only two of them. One of them is buried and it's in the ground and I can't see it. So I stick my screwdriver down there and see if my screwdriver Let's see if I can feel anything. If my screwdriver goes into some structural load-bearing post, um, that's a major defect. And so is that. So there's a post. It's not above ground or above grade. The bottom of it is embedded into the concrete. So I can't tell where it terminates, where it ends. Ideally, this, even though it's treated, I want that treated post to be visible. I want it to have some distance away from the ground and that is actually going through the poured concrete patio material uh, some cracking there um, bottom right corner has some damage bottom left corner and then the deck flashing itself underneath the deck i get to see a lot like the ledger board attachment the fasteners the flashing see what's going on there and i don't like what i see so We've got some toenails, and um, that's, an, that's a screw that is rusting. And I've got one lag screw next to some nails. I don't see flashing. See a, a bit of a ledger board here. It's kind of an odd way to attach the deck to the house. You can imagine this simply will withdraw if the deck tends to move away. There's no... Um, 
support, right? Decks collapse. You'll hear them collapsing every once in a while. So there's no metal joist hangers, and there's nothing here, no support. And there's flashing here at the bottom of the ledger board, but I'm really concerned also with the ledger board flashing at the top of the ledger board so it's properly installed. And I'm concerned because I see a lot of water in between the flashing, right, that comes out and the ledger board itself. It's actually dirty, filled with like debris, as if there's water and debris moving behind the ledger board and coming out. So I'm kind of concerned about the way this deck is attached to that home. And that'll be in my report. And to get a really great idea of how flashing is to be installed, we did a video with some, with some fancy graphics. So there's the wall there. Now the exterior wall covering below the deck. The bottom Z flashing. Counter flashing, sometimes a self-adhesive membrane. The ledger board itself. The top Z flashing. Counter flashing that overlaps the Z flashing. And the exterior wall covering, which overlaps the counter flashing. So I doubt that that's what we have on this deck. So I'm a bit concerned. Uh, we have carpenter um, bees um, in certain parts of the country. There's these fat bumblebees that drill perfectly uh, round, one and a half inch diameter holes, go in, make a 90 degree angle, and put their babies in there. And then that hole is followed by a woodpecker. So there's a woodpecker following a carpenter bee hole. Um, and there's a woodpecker hole as well. So a couple things on the exterior siding. I'm not required to inspect those things, not required to report it, but I do. If I see a defect, I'll point it out. That's the bottom plate of the foundation of the wall, the wood structure of the wall. So it's probably a two by eight, two by six, um, and uh, it's exposed with the, um, they call it a termite shield. So that's a, a defect. So I'm looking for a lot of moisture issues at this house and structural problems. And it's all around. There's some foam, we call it a, an air sealant gap. It really doesn't work very well. But that's a structural component that's exposed. That's not good. Um, I have to remember that the dryer vent exhausts in the back. And there is the air conditioner, right? Oh, there's the filter, two arrows. It's a heat pump system. Uh, electrical disconnect. And the system looks good. And there's the thermostat, programmable. Um, I'm just taking a look at the uh, questions. Do you have any training on drones to do roof inspections? Um, nope. Remember, in this country, um, FAA has some rules about using drones. It's essentially for fun. It's not for commercial use. Um, but we are actually, um, Canada is ahead of the curve in regulations on drones. Um, and there you have some regulations and some training and some certifications. FAA is coming out with a, um, an application to get your drone certified and recognized um, for certain purposes. Uh, we update all that kind of stuff on our message board. So visit our message board and do a search for drones. You could also email me. And we are developing a, an online training course for um, how to use a drone, just some safety course. Um, chimney has no cover, efflorescence, basement wall, marginal report. Okay, good questions, good questions. So we'll keep going. Um, there's the heat pump interior evaporator unit. I may have hit the wrong button and deleted some questions by mistake, I think, now that I'm thinking about it. We had a few more questions here, but now they're missing. I, that may have been my fault. So if you want to ask a question, feel free, type it in. Um, 
There's the evaporator area. Uh, take an easy picture of the air filter that's washable and needs to be cleaned every 30 days. And the newsletter will remind my clients to change their air filter. Um, the large line is a suction line. It's insulated. The thin line, smaller diameter line is the liquid line. Um, there's the electrical line going to the um, electric heating element um, in the unit, interior unit. There's the condensate drain line. So when I go to a system and I inspect a system, you may have seen it already, I tend to take a picture of the system and then I go in deeper um, in more detail and I take pictures of every component of that system and I'm looking for a defect or a problem or something to comment on or put in my report. So I take a picture of every component of every system and that forces me to inspect everything. It's almost like I can't mess up. And my mobile device also has every system and every component in the system. And I can't go to the next system in my report without checking every component of the system. So it's a really good double. It's a really good method to keep in, in mind um, as you do your inspection procedure, to inspect every component of every system and know what every component of every system is. That's the discharge tube from the condensate pump. There's the main shutoff valve, a nice ball valve. That's good. There's the water meter with the line going out to a reader on the outside, the sensor. There's the grounding, bonding. Uh, there's no jumper, though, so I like to have a jumper. Part If the water meter is removed, I want that electrical connection. Hot water source, electric hot water tank. Water shutoff valve on the inline. Electric line going in. It's a grounding wire. I see the grounding wire there. I take a picture of every manufacturing label. Um, this one tells me the manufacturing date. I don't have to look it up. And it's also 50 gallons. There's the discharge temperature pressure relief valve and the discharge to the floor. And we also have a hot water tank course. We asked the manufacturer of a hot water tank couple of them, to um, cut them open for us and send them to us. And we did a, a training video. Um, that go crazy. It's not on the outer side of the tank. What's all this right here? So we break down the training into components. We go over every component, inside and out. So inside, we, we tear a hole into the tank so we can take a look on the inside of the tank. Electric ignition, similar to your gas grill. And that's a, a master plumber teaching the hot water tank course. And that's free and online. Um, sump pump, there it is. So tell me the things that you can see in this picture that should be of concern during your inspection report or inspection procedure, sorry. Well, um, Taking a look at this picture, you can see that it's a concrete masonry unit foundation, right? And they tend to be porous. So I'm looking for moisture, and there it is. So there's a lot of moisture coming through the foundation wall. And there's efflorescence, indications of salt deposits left behind after the evaporation. And there's this groove around the perimeter of the found, um, basement floor to catch water and direct it into the underground drainage system, if there is one. There wasn't one when this house was built. They installed one after, and I can tell that because this is different concrete than from the original basement floor. So you can see the line where new concrete meets old concrete. And they did that because they installed a sump pump. Hopefully an underground drainage system where the drainage pipes meet and drain into the sump pump. The sump pump is installed, and there's a check valve. I can see it there, and it discharges outside. And we saw that at the downspout pipe there is an opening in the sump pump. So if this is in an area, this home is in an area where there's high concentrations of level, a high probability of radon, elevated radon levels in the home, there's a way to install a sump pump lid that helps with that radon concentration. We don't, this is an entry point for radon gas. That's what I'm saying. So that should be sealed up in a particular way. And there's no battery backup. So it's plugged in goes up here to a plug, and there's no battery backup. That would be a great idea. And the basement must be humid because there's a humidifier, and it's on and running, and it's actively draining into the sump pump. That's a lot to see from that one picture. It's a lot to comment on. 
gives you a really great idea of what's going on outside because water problems inside a structure tend to be related to what's going on outside. And there's a lot of things going on outside. Remember the downspout? So a few things just based upon that. I tend to reach in. If it's a manual float, I activate the float. I can see that the the contractors installed some underground drainage pipes. They're perforated. I can see the crack there. There's a check valve. No backup system, though. If that fails during a, a flood event, um, there's going to be some trouble there. And I actually make a note as to standing water in the sump pump or not. If the sump pump is dry, the bucket is dry, or if there's water, standing water, and there's standing water in this sump pump. I think my client ought to know that. Again, if you're a non-member attending this live class, you can get a 50% discount off your first year membership to InternetG by emailing me. If you're watching this on YouTube and you didn't take the live class, it's not for you. So it's a benefit to those students who are attending this live class who are not members of InternetG but want to join. Let's go to the electrical system, yeah? Um, uh, Danny, I just asked, uh, answered your question. Um, is a home inspector required to open the AC unit? No, um, you're not allowed, you're not required to open any panel actually of anything. Um, not, you don't have to dismantle anything. I think the word dismantle is in the standards. You're not required to dismantle it or open it up or take it apart. Um, it's a visual only inspection. You have to explain to your client that you have two hands and they're behind your back. And it's a visual only, it's like walking through a home with your hands tied behind your back, you know? You can do a whole home inspection just like this. So you don't have to take anything apart like an AC unit. However, sometimes I carry a, um, I don't have it here on my teaching, in my teaching class. Um, it's a, um, you can get it at Home Depot or a hardware store. It's a, it's a screwdriver with multiple uh, attachments, <clears throat> like six. And some of them you pull out, like the uh, Phillips attachment, and it becomes a quarter inch um, hex uh, screw um, attachment. So you can take off screws, and then I take a peek in there to see if I can see the evaporator and see if it's um, clogged with, if, see if the fins um, need cleaning or not. And then I put it back. But that's going well beyond the standards of practice. Uh, what inspection report software do you use? Um, there's a few that I used to use, um, but if you go to Inspector Outlet, go to inspectoroutlet.com, that's our e-commerce partner, inspectoroutlet.com, and on the left side, navigation panel, left side of that website, there'll be software, there's a link to software, and there are exclusive discounts for InternetG members. If you're a non-member, there's some really great discounts there. So if you want to join InternetG and buy software at the same time, there's some really special software there. And um, there are vendors who have software that work with um, droids, iPhones, iOS or Mac devices, tablets, PCs, um, desktop stuff, tablet stuff, iPhone stuff, droid stuff. So um, going mobile is really... It was the only way my company, multi-inspector firm, could get really fast and grow. We went mobile because our inspectors came back to the office at the end of the day, essentially all done. Their reports were written, their photos were inserted, um, and all we had to do was do some paperwork, electronic paperwork, and send it out. And there are also companies um, that will help you manage those inspectors and their reports and um, scheduling and things like that. Um, and I can help you with that if you need that help. Um, another question. Um, do you look at the ductwork in the attic and comment on how ducts are sealed or not sealed? Absolutely, yep. And we have a lot of training on that. Um, we have energy efficiency training courses. Um, I inspect, I used to inspect those anyways before I was trained by InternetG on how to properly inspect ductwork and insulation and um, air leakage and energy deficiencies. Now we have all that training available. Um, a lot of people are asking me about the software. You can email me 
um, I'm on the contact page and I can send you some links. But if you go to Inspector Outlet, um, there's the software that I would actually recommend. Um, Brian, I don't do any combustion safety testing, although I know how to do a CAS test. Um, an electric water heater, does Romex wire need to be uh, enclosed in conduit? Um, not where I come from. So the local authority having jurisdiction allows the Romex NMB um, to be like that. Um, conduit is, when you think about conduit, I think about commercial or um, in an area where, um, well, I think about commercial really. In residential, it's typically um, okay. Uh, if you see, but uh, um, look at your local code and ask your um, local authority having jurisdiction, your local code inspector. Um, if you see efflorescence on a wall, but the basement is dry, do you make it marginal? I don't use the word marginal. No one knows. I think of books. That's where margins are. Um, it's really um, material defect is what you're required to report according to the standards of practice. Material defects. Know what a material defect is and not is. Um, and then I use conventional terms like correction by professional is needed, repair by the homeowner could be done, or monitoring. I use those combinations, correction. Um, whenever I make a recommendation, I always follow up with a professional coming in after me and inspecting further because a contractor is, allowed, is hired to get in there with tools and dismantle and take apart things and look forward and look, be, go beyond the scope of a home inspector, a home inspector. I'm a home inspector, it's a visual inspection only. So when I make a recommendation for a contractor to come in and repair something, I always recommend that contractor go well beyond my scope because it's a visual inspection only. And they will, they'll look for other things. And that tends to cause problems with these two industries, inspection industry and contractor industry because the contractor will come in not fully understanding the scope of a home inspector, being visual only, and will say, oh, your home inspector should have found this after removing a panel cover off the air conditioner or something. See, we don't, we don't get, we have a, a clear scope of work, um, but always recommend uh, someone coming in as a professional to go further. Um, so I don't use marginal because I'm not sure. We actually have a, a course, um, report writing course, and we help you um, identify defects and write narratives that um, describe that defect with uh, standard language. You may might be interested in using that. Um, do you test the TPR valve, Jeff? No, we don't test any valves. Don't test any valves, especially a temperature pressure relief valve, especially on a hot boiler. Um, <laughs> sometimes they won't close. Um, no clean out valves, no discharge pipes, no shut off valves. I don't turn off shut off valves. If the, if the house is vacant and somebody needs to turn on the water, I ask the homeowner or the seller's agent, but that's typically handled by my office manager prior to me stepping into the home. We want all the water and electricity on so we can do a full comprehensive home inspection. Don't turn on any valves. Um, in Louisiana, we have to remove the dead front cover to inspect the interior. Um, that's interesting. So I'm, I'll take a look at that. Didn't really fully realize that. I'd love to see the language of um, that legislation asking the home inspector to remove the dead front cover of electrical panel. Um, be careful. Okay, because even though it's not really high voltage commercial stuff, um, there could be an arc and uh, you are not required to remove the dead front cover of the electrical panel. It's, it's really hazardous, so don't. You're not required to and you shouldn't. So um, how do you determine if there's aluminum wiring if you don't take the front cover off? And the, oh, there are several ways. Um, one of them is, well, if you're in an older home, you have to age the home. So if you're in an older home in the 70s, really in the United States in the 70s, copper is expensive and we try to use aluminum for residential branch wiring and didn't work out very well. And so um, sometimes you could see the wires coming in to the uh, electrical panel. Sometimes you can see um, th with the covering. Sometimes you can see the connections on the switch. Um, any unfinished areas would be great, but a switch, um, a junction box, um, you can pull the plate cover off and take a look at the wiring that way. Um, careful, um, don't recommend it. 
Again, you don't need to probe anything. You don't need to go beyond the scope of a home inspection. There are several ways to take a look. Um, I tend to, when I was a home inspector, I took the dead front cover off. Um, but I used safety equipment, personal PPE, personal protection equipment. And um, we'll take a look at that as well. It's coming up. Uh, comments on mini circuits use in full electrical panel. Mini circuits. Not sure what that is. Does Florida require inspector to hand out SOP to each homeowner? I'm not sure. Um, call it Florida DBPR. Ask them. Um, I guess some states require that. Um, I always used to include the standards of practice, international standards of practice in my inspection report. And also linked it in my electronic online agreement so that my client had full knowledge of the standards of practice to which I perform my inspections. All right, that's the end of those questions. Keep them coming. Where are we? Oh yeah, electrical panel. I take the dead front cover off. Not required to. I don't recommend it. Uh, there's a double tap at the top right, a top left corner, 15 amp breaker. I don't want that. Um, this um, is a newer wire on a newer NM, an interior uh, branch circuit wiring, and it's not labeled. So I'm going to call that out. I want to know what that wire is, where it's going. It's not labeled. It could be something in the basement. Could be that sump pump that was installed. Um, ideally, you want that sump pump on a breaker by itself. You don't want to double tap something. Um, there's the SC cable coming in, so for entr entrance cable. Um, there's a screw with a tip on the dead front cover. So when that's a danger. When I screw that back in, um, there's a tip there. I don't want to puncture uh, a wire and get zapped and cause a spark. So you could see that right there at that sump pump, that electrical panel was located, and that moisture is all over that. Remember that front right corner where on the downspout pipe, we saw that sump pump discharge on the outside of the house going in. I don't think it was installed properly because it was at an angle. I mean, how do you get an angle in there? Somebody actually put in a fitting that fit perfectly? I don't think so. And look what the result is. This whole corner is all wet. And I don't need to, I don't need to uh, get a moisture meter out, although I carry one. Um, it has a probe. It also has... Um, a little warning sensor, okay, or a probe. Um, you can also use your infrared. Um, you should be trained on using infrared. Oh, let's bring this over. Whoop. It's all kind of fun when uh, you're trained and certified by InterNACHI. You can do all this kind of stuff. We train you on using an uh, infrared camera. It's called infrared certified. It's a certification, um, so that's me. Right there. Um, and this is a, a FLIR C2, by the way. It's, a, it's really nice for a pocket. It's a few hundred dollars. Um, you can buy a FLIR C2 at Inspector Outlet. And um, it's low resolution. Um, it's not high resolution only. It's like the lowest resolution. But um, I'm not quantifying anything. I'm qualifying something. I'm looking for anomalies. I'm not measuring anything. I could care less about the temperature. I'm looking for something that looks odd. You know? So, I'm looking around. There's my drone. It's kind of warm there. There's the table. So, from 10 feet away, is this any good? Do I have to have high resolution? Well, I'm not sure. So, you know, here's a little little spray bottle and I sprayed it over there. And from 10 feet away, I can see that that is a bit wet. I mean, this looks dry to me. It even feels dry on my hand, but um, that is a sign, an anomaly. And it's also on the floor. Oh, now I can see that. I'm about 10 feet away, right? And I'm using this low resolution FLIR C2 camera. And yeah, it's about all I need to know, about all I need to see. Just need to see something that's gonna catch my eye. So if I was in a basement and I was doing this, scrolling past, scrolling past, scrolling past, scrolling past, whoop. Yeah, I could see that very quickly, 10 feet away. Um, in this basement of this home inspection, um, obviously you can, whoop, let me reduce this now. 
get this out of the way. Boop. Love the Flare C2. So that was also part of my service, and it's also part of my brand. Uh, I became the home inspector who did free infrared thermal scans. Free, I include it with my home inspection. Every home inspection, I brought this out. I actually gave it to my client to play with so that they can fully understand what I was doing. And what I did was, um, I did one of these things. I don't know if you've done it. You know, you put your hand down and then you take your hand away and there's your hand. Like you can see your hand from 10 feet away. There's your hand, it's warm. And they're like, ah, I get it. You're looking for temperature on the surface, yep. Anything cool could be wet. Anything hot could be something else. So if I see something wet, cool, indications of an anomaly that could be wet, I go down and I'll, I'll probe it with my probe to confirm. Also, this is a great tool as well. Everyone should carry one. Your hand can also sense airflow, um, heat, coolness, moisture. In this house, um, I didn't need an infrared, but I could scan it over there and it'd be obvious. Good way to confirm that there's moisture in that home. And by the way, again, the infrared allowed me to distinguish my services from everyone else. That's how we became the best home inspection company in, in my area, which was southeastern Pennsylvania with about 200 home inspectors in a 20 mile radius of me. So to be number one, you really have to think, you have to be good, like we learned earlier in this class. You have to be good te technically, but you also have to, good, have to be trained very well and do well with your marketing and business practices. I take a ton of pictures, as you can tell. So I took maybe 50 pictures down in the basement. I move drywall, um, move uh, drop ceiling, you're not required to, but I move it when I need to. And here is a watermark on one of the drop ceilings, and I wanted to know what was up there. So I removed the panel, and it looks like a toilet flange leak. Like there's something going on here. Something's leaking and dripping down in that corner. So put it in the report. And then I move the insulation. I use a three, t I don't have it with me, a three tine hoe, a gardening hoe, it's extendable. It goes down to two feet and extends to five. It has three tines in it for gardening. They're bent. I make one straight, somewhat straight, and really curved. And with those three things, I could probe, I can move insulation, put it right back. So up here, I moved insulation and I put it right back. That is wet. We have moisture coming through. And this area is near the deck flashing. Remember the deck flashing? This is moisture at the deck flashing area, and I can show you that later. There's the corner of the deck flashing. So we're going to the, the, um, the oh no, this is the chimney, that's right. This is the chimney, it's not the deck flashing. This is the chimney shot, this is the corner. This is the masonry underneath the, the chimney, I mean the fireplace, hearth. Um, this wood really should be removed actually, by standard. Um, and so I tend to move things away, look and put back and take pictures of everything before and after. I also have a moisture probe. So I don't have to um, bend down all over the place using this little device. It's on a stick. I'm not sure if they make them anymore. I can't really find them. But uh, I probe it, has two pins, gives me an audible sound if it senses something wet. Again, I could care less about actually measuring moisture content. I just want to feel moisture, I want to find moisture. And it's wet there at the rear slider door at the basement. And there's more marks at the clean out. I think they had a lot of clogging or something in this house at the drain pipes. So I'm looking for moisture. There's the shutoff valve to the spigot outside. The floor joists look good. That is really wet right there by the water, main water coming into the home. And it's finished, so I really can't see. And I think that double tap was for this bedroom down in the basement to finish the bedroom. There's probably one circuit in there, and this is it. But I called for an electrician to come in anyways. And that's about it. I mean, there's a lot of storage that I can't get through. I want to make sure my pictures show my inspection restrictions. 
and there's a lot of moisture down in the basement because there's a few fish tanks. And that's about it. Bathroom downstairs, GFCI, toilet, sink. Now I'm in the attic. A lot of storage. The structure looks okay. Insulation. That's the attic access. There's no insulation. That's a little door, right? Little door in the wall to the unfinished attic. Um, it's not insulated. There's no weather stripping. It's not sealed. It's not an insulated door. So it's really a hole in the thermal envelope. And that's where the home energy score assessor qualification comes in because you're gonna be trained in this type of defect. If you um, become a home energy score assessor, you get a bunch of tools that you can use. One of them is um, calculating the weighted average of the R value of the insulation you see. So let's say you inspect an attic, unfinished attic, and all of it's insulated very well, good quality, R30, 10 inches thick, vapor retarder, and 100% of it is covered, right? The floor is covered really well, insulation. But the attic access, let's say it was um, a second floor bedroom, closet, ceiling, hatch, right? You go in, that's very common. It's not insulated, right? Let's say that little hatch makes up 5% only of the entire attic floor, right? 95% is R30, 5% has no insulation. What happens to the weighted average of the R value? What would you say? In your inspection report, you'd probably say, oh, the attic is well insulated. R30, 10 inches, good. Oh, uh, yeah, and add some insulation to that hatch. But let's say it's not 100%. Let's say it's 95% R30, right? And 5% um, has no insulation. So again, R30, 95% of the attic floor is insulated, but there's nothing on that small attic access. What happens to the, the weighted average of the R value of the attic? It turns into almost nothing because there is so much energy loss through that uninsulated little hole. The whole house is just bleeding conditioned air. In cold climates, there's a huge natural draft going on. In all buildings, there's a natural draft, but in a cold climate in the wintertime, the heated air conditioned air, the heated air in the house is really drafting up through anything that um, isn't sealed, like air leakage, and insulated. So that attic hatch without insulation, no air sealant, is really bleeding heated air. That's bleeding energy. And that's costing a lot of money. So down in the basement, you may say this is a high efficiency heating system, but the experience that your client is going to have is it's not a high efficiency heating system. It's really working a lot harder than it needs because there's a hole in the roof. There's a hole in the ceiling of the attic, right? The insulation has a hole and the weighted average is really hardly anything. So this kind of knowledge, understanding, skill, ability, is provided to you through this program, Home Energy Score Assessor. Become a Home Energy Score Assessor. This is for only United States only. And the training is free and online to members. Uh, some questions here. Do you inspect a clearance in front of the panel, the electrical panel, I think you're referring to? Yep. Um, there's a training course, there's a diagram. Um, you know, I like to see three feet, four feet, three feet, three feet. I like to see a lot. I don't, I know there's a minimum, but I want a lot of room. In fact, I like people to stay away from me. Go away, stand over there while I take a look at the electrical panel. While I'm inspecting, there's a clearance. Um, Wisconsin also requires removing the panel cover. Interesting. Um, uh, so Eric asks, do you have resources available that list the recommended PPE for certain tests? Yes, we have a safety course. It's an online safety course. You go to our education page. It's one of the top um, courses. It's free and online. And it goes through 
I think it's safety practices for every home inspector, it's called. Um, dead front with the pointed screw, yep. Do you reinsert it? No, actually, I left it off. Um, but there's a problem now. You know, one of the panels, uh, the screw is missing. So actually, I have a set of screws. It's in my truck. Um, so I go get it. It's, you can tell it's a panel screw. It's thin uh, thread and um, a flat front. I um, also have um, battery-operated uh, drill that I bring, um, drywall screws, um, sealant. Um, even um, some inspectors um, will clean things. Um, they have little cleaning brushes to get rid of their um, finger marks on the ceiling. Um, there's a lot of things you can bring. Um, Robert asked a question. Andrea. Um, so when you call, Andrea asks, when you call... A contractor in after the inspection is it an extra co cost to your clients? If so, how much? Uh, sorry, I'm I wasn't clear. In my inspection report, I make recommendations for defects to be fixed, and in that narrative, that um, paragraph of explaining um, the defect and recommendation, I recommend that a contractor, a licensed contractor, certified contractor, come in and f and use my inspection report as a guide to find more problems go beyond the scope of my inspection and find more problems and fix them. Don't just fix what I put in a report. Have that contractor, it's called further evaluation. Um, so that's what I'm talking about. Um, my recommendations to have things fixed uh, include having a contractor come in. I don't do any scheduling or pricing or anything like that. I'm just there to make recommendations. Find problems and make recommendations to fix them. Um, Donald asks, do you include it in the report or uh, the energy? Do you include um, the energy report or do you charge extra for it? Well, there's two ways to skin that cat, right? You charge extra for the standing alone, standalone service. Let's say you do a home energy score. I don't know, whatever you want to charge, 50 bucks, 75, 100 bucks, whatever, it's up to you. Um, or you can include it with every home inspection if you're in the United States. That's what I would do to beat you in the market because I'm already doing free infrared scans with my infrared camera and I'm doing um, free moisture inspections with every home inspection because I'm a certified moisture inspector through InterNACHI. And I'd also provide a home energy score for every home that I inspect. You can't beat that in the market. And that extra value you have to then communicate as to why you should be hired on your website and in your marketing. I charge extra because I provide extra, and I'm the best. That's the kind of attitude and message you need to have. I'm going to beat the inspector who provides a good inspection and a report within 24 hours. A part of my brand is to beat that competition, to offer things that no one else in my market can offer. So I get up on the roof. Um, I tell clients I was a home builder. Um, I use tall ladders. I use free infrared scans on every inspection. I include moisture inspections on every ins inspection. I make sure that my client understands I bring an infrared and a moisture meter. Um, and I also include a home energy score, a home energy report. That's another program, a home energy report for every inspection. If I was doing home energy scores, I'd hit slap on a score. It only takes me a few more minutes to provide that extra value. That's part of my brand, and that's why I should be hired. Um, I inspect an unfinished attic with an AC evaporator. Yeah, sometimes um, the the units are in the attic system. That's okay. The heating and there's there could be an HVAC system in unfinished spaces, attic, crawl space, basement. Um, Eddie says the value goes way down. I'm not sure what you're talking about. Um, let's see. Uh, Mr. Artemis asks, what kind of infrared camera will we need? You don't need an infrared camera to do a home inspection. We're talking about branding and providing extra value so that you can beat your competition in the market with extra value. And so the infrared camera that I was using was a FLIR C2 camera, and you can get it at Inspector Outlet, our e-commerce partner. Uh, can we see your report of your inspection? Yep. So if you email me, I'll send it to you. 
Uh, it's going to be kind of big, maybe a few megabytes, but it should go over the internet um, email very well. And uh, I could have it downloadable too. Just email me, Stan, or anybody if you want to see my inspection report from this inspection. Um, Bob says, I like the home energy score idea, which is pretty much untouched in Wisconsin. Yep, I've been to Wisconsin. I've talked to the governor uh, and the senators there, and we tried to get um, some things going about energy. Um, this is probably going to be the big thing coming up, home energy score. Um, we're talking about climate change. Everyone's talking about climate change. Um, you know, 70, I think it's 75% of all electricity produced in the United States is used by our homes and buildings in which we work and live. And I think that it's about 30% of that um, is wasted <laughs> or 40%, something ridiculous. Our homes and the buildings in which we work and live um, waste energy. And um, I think it's a great opportunity for a home inspector to talk intelligently about saving energy. Because when your client saves energy, then they're saving money. And we have the ability to quantify this service. So you can tell when you produce a home energy score, for example, you can tell your client that you could save, let's say, for example, $1,200 every year if you follow the recommendations in the report. And the report is produced, the home energy score report is produced with a click of a button. The Department of Energy writes it for you. Internet she doesn't write it, you don't write it. Department of Energy writes it for the particular home that you inspect. It's specific to the conditions of the home that you inspect. So it's customized. It's a customized report that can be produced in a couple minutes and you put a score on it. Soon all MLSs, uh, our goal is to have every MLS um, with the home energy score because it's an affordable way to value the home energy efficiency. Okay, so I think we're scheduled for an hour and a half and it's coming up on 11.30. So I think we're, we're doing well. Um, this is the interior. Um, I have my receptacle tester that uh, gives me lights uh, indicating that it's wired properly um, or at least it doesn't show me. Uh, there's a duct. So I pull the floor register cover off and I stick my hand in there sometimes. Um, and I oftentimes find sawdust from when the house was originally built and they never cleaned the ducts. So um, indoor air quality is um, an issue for many of my clients who are sensitive to dust, dust mites, indoor air quality issues. And um, this picture adds value to my service. It says that I'm an inspector who looks at things like this. I'm concerned about energy and also indoor air quality. You can't beat my inspection report. My inspection report, I work on every day and I throw images like this into my inspection report because my report is the best piece of marketing that I produce. Someone uh, in Wisconsin, I was just at an event in Wisconsin and they asked me um, about blogs and about social networking and posting things. And I said, you should do this. Take a picture of like that, all right? And put it up on Facebook or your blog, a website blog, and then write a few sentences about that condition and why you're the only inspector in my area that can find that kind of stuff because that's the kind of service you provide. And do that every other day, maybe once a week. You, Google loves rich, unique content, right? And you can provide that kind of content um, with your own stuff. So you don't have to copy paste home maintenance stuff off of the internet. You have the rich, unique content. Get a picture like that, put it on Facebook, write a few things, uh, your, your business Facebook page, write a few things about it. Make sure you mention the city and state in which you inspected that condition. And um, that's a very easy way for you to um, social, uh, create um, traction on the internet via social networking. Um, no grippable handrail from the second floor. That's a bit of a danger. Um, when I open up um, a representative number of windows, um, I take a look on the outside and I grab the uh, trim. Remember, remember that second floor window we saw when we were on the ground outside? And we're taking a look and we saw uh, that window frame. There it is there. 
so that there's something wrong there. This window frame is really in poor shape. A lot of the windows were in bad shape. They were old. Um, they were not opened and used very much, and this is actually wood. Um, so when I break something, when I grab wood off of a window frame, I take a picture of it. I don't hide it. I take a picture of it. If I am testing the garage door opener with my hands and it falls off the rails, if I am underneath the bathroom sink cabinet, you know, under the sink, and I grab the soft brass uh, drain pipe and it crushes in my hand, if I test a ground fault tester with my tester and it doesn't reset, if I turn on the dishwasher and it leaks on the floor, if I turn on the heating system and the pilot ignition system goes like this, it never lights. If I do something and it breaks in front of me while I'm doing my inspection, that's my role. Don't get freaked out about it. That is why you were hired. Thank goodness you, that broke while you were there. Otherwise, your client would have moved in and it would have broke for them and then their knee-jerk reaction would be to call you. Hey, why didn't you find this problem? You should be patted on the back when you break something. When something breaks in your hand, you should be given, hey, thanks, you did a good job finding that defect. When the garage door falls down because you are working within the scope of a home inspection according to an international standards of practice and performing a visual only inspection like we talked about, using normal operating controls and something breaks, something broke during normal operation. So don't freak out when you break something or something breaks in your hand. This is a great picture. When I grab Rotten wood off of a window frame? I'm taking a picture of it and putting it in a report. Look what I found. So showers, you run, run water at the showers, flush the toilets, run water at the sinks, hot and cold water, run the shower at the same time, see if there's a decrease in the pressure. GFCI, I take a look at the corners, especially when I'm running water at the angles near the corners. I want to see it bleed out. I want water to come out and report it as a defect. If it doesn't, great. If it does, I'm, I'm right there to see that break. Run fans. There's, um, there's a stain or something. Somebody painted over something in the ceiling. So when I'm going around with my, <clears throat> excuse me, with my infrared camera, Oops, can I drag this over? Yeah. Right? I'm going around with my infrared camera. It's a FLIR C2. And I'm taking a look at stuff. Right? I'm taking a look at the ceiling or whatever. And I see something, an anomaly. That's the light above my head, by the way. Um, it's like 20 feet away. Um, you know, I, I'll want to put that anomaly in the report. I don't care what it is. Something odd, something different, something not looking like it, something different than all the rest. Um, so I want to put that in a report and the infrared and helps me see that quickly. Um, also, just making sure that I inspect every component of every system like we talked about earlier. I take a look at the ceiling. The ceiling is a, is a system in the standards of practice. And I take a look at the corners real quick. Just go around the corners, especially the second floor ceiling underneath an unfinished attic space. I want to look for defects. Maybe the if this was a truss built, it's not a truss built home. If the trusses were lifting, I want to see some cracking. Or if there was an old water leak, you know, I want to see indications of problems. I don't know what the cause is. I don't need to know. I, I'm not in the business of diagnosing. I'm just looking for anomalies, and that doesn't look right. So I'm putting in a report. Have a contractor look at it. Um, any smoke detector that's yellow needs to be replaced. Um, and this one is hardwired, but no battery backup and no CO. So nowadays they have these fantastic hardwired battery backup. It could be connected to a system, a uh, security system, fire system, alarm system. Um, and it's smoke and carbon monoxide. So I recommend a lot of those being installed. Every floor, every hallway, every bedroom, um, on and on. Laundry, second floor laundry, that clothes washer better have a catch pan, and it does. 
Um, there's the, remember the dryer vent on the outside? Um, this is probably in need of replacement. Um, could be cleaned out at least. Um, the water pressure hoses should be braided stainless steel pressure tested hoses. Um, and there's the crack in the, um, in the catch pan underneath the clothes washer. So that's a good, good catch there. Second floor bathroom looks good. Um, I take a picture. I'm not required to in inspect for um, cats and dogs, but I um, or odors. Um, but I take a picture and I note um, indications of uh, pets, like a cat. Um, there's the interior. Uh, five minutes until we're done with our time here together. Um, taking pictures of any component of any window. That this is the the rolling uh, arm that opens and closes um, the window itself. Uh, heating um, elements. So there's a the supply register under a uh, semi-attached permanent structure. I don't know if that corner cabinet is staying. I'm looking at the floor, just like I look at the ceiling. Taking a look at the trim, even. The condition of the floor, especially if it's tile. I want to make sure that the tiles, when I knock on the tiles, they sound solid. They don't sound strange. And there's the door, bottom corner, um, has a wood rot at the deck. So now I go outside, uh, there's the wood rot. Now I take off my interior shoes and I put back on my exterior shoes and I go on the deck. And I walk around the deck, do my inspection, take off my exterior shoes, step inside with my socks, put on my interior only shoes and continue with my inspection. We wear indoor only shoes at every inspection. Um, the railing is okay, the siding's okay, wood rod at the door. Um, I'm gonna call that out as a missing flashing or a flashing defect of some kind. I have water penetration on the inside. Um, I have indications of uh, improper insulation, um, poor insulation, um, not meeting the standards, um, potentially a, a deck, uh, material defect there. Um, oh, so I cross my fingers when something doesn't work. So the GFCI out there wasn't testing properly. So it was dead actually. So I must have tripped it at the second floor bathroom GFCI receptacle. Now I got to go back in, indoor shoes only, run upstairs, reset the GFCI, come outside, trip it again, and then I got to reset it again. Um, try to remember um, resetting the GFCIs. Um, the door to the deck is um, about a half an inch separated from the jam, the side frame. So that allows a lot of energy loss right there. There's the fireplace. The inside looks pretty good. They have a, a, a shield to reflect some heat. They're not covering up a defect in the back. Um, could be cleaned out and swept. Um, there's some creosote buildup. The brown stuff I'm not too concerned about. It's the black, oily, shiny stuff. That's creosote that can catch on fire. It's a fire hazard. So every fireplace, basically, if it hasn't been cleaned that day, I recommend it to be cleaned. And um, my home maintenance newsletter talks about fireplaces because it's a customized monthly newsletter based upon what I inspect. Kitchen, basic kitchen, nothing fancy. Garbage disposal works. It's plugged in. GFCIs test properly. Except that one. Oh, that one did not work. So um, I cross my fingers for uh, helping me remember that what works and what doesn't work. I run a short cycle of the dishwasher, make sure it opens and closes. There's no major damage that I can see on the inside. And I turn on the heating elements of the electric stove and the oven. And um, that's it for our home inspection. Um, again, I'm going to leave you with um, everything, um, natchee.org forward slash everything. If you um, don't know where to go, um, go there. If you want to sign up for the next class, it's at natchee.org forward slash webinar. And um, the, all of our past webinars are there. And our future webinar um, about tax, tax deductions um, is going to be there. And uh, if you need me, that's me. Ben Gamico, Internachi, natchee.org forward slash webinar. And um, 
there's a, a few questions. Um, Bob asked, do you ever deal with inspection of rental energy efficiency? It used to be called DLRL in Wisconsin. Um, yeah, every state, just about every county has something special, some kind of energy program. A few years ago, the feds funded hundreds of um, energy programs. Um, some were state-sponsored, some private. Um, so I'm, I'm not familiar with that acronym or that name. But the latest, greatest thing is the home energy score. And I think it's going to stick around for a while because um, I get to speak with um, higher-ups in the Department of Energy, and um, this has been around for many years. We've piloted, InterNACHI has piloted with the Department of Energy and the Colorado Department of Energy, and um, I think the goal, our goal really is to have every MLS with a home energy score. So it's a really great opportunity for home inspectors. We are on the, the front edge of this wave. So catch it now, become a home energy score assessor now. And um, especially if you're in the United States, it doesn't work um, just the United States home energy score. If you're in another country, you can become an internet certified home energy inspector. That's a different certification. Um, right, Edward, he just asked, will the home energy reports work in Canada? Um, the home energy software that we have available works only on US housing stock. But you can become a, a home energy inspector through training and certification in any country. Just the software doesn't work. When you get a chance, can you please uh, send me a copy of a report? Yep, you got to email me. Um, what happens when that part of the house breaks? How's liability played out? We talked about that. Uh, thank you for making the webinar longer. Uh, plastic vent pipes are dangerous. Plastic vent pipes are dangerous. Plastic vent pipes. You must be talking about the dryer, especially if it's gas fired, right? Um, you're allowed to have that flexible thing, uh, metal, uh, I prefer. Whenever, actually, uh, here's what I say. Anything that's plastic, the plastic vent pipes, especially the, the uh, slinky one, the coiled one, they always clog up, they always crack open. It's not reliable. It's the cheapest piece of junk that somebody could install. What you want is um, something flexible and metal in between the solid metal vent pipe, exhaust pipe, and the appliance itself. It has to be flexible in there. Um, to just to, for practical purposes, but you want metal and you want smooth metal and you don't want any screws going into because the, the tips of the screws clog up with lint. Um, you want it sealed. Um, there's a few things. We have a training article about dryer exhausts according to a, um, international code of building. So, um, if you need that, um, it's a really good article. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. That's it, folks. Um, if you need to uh, contact me, I'm on the contact page. Please sign up for the next live class. It's at natcha.org forward slash webinar. I hope you had fun. I did. Uh, it's an honor. See you next time. See you next class. Bye, everybody.